Okay, I've started the YouTube live stream. Thank you, Daniel. So it's almost time. All right, so our next speaker is Professor Sanya Fiedler from University of Toronto. Uh, she is also the direct director of AI at NVIDIA and a founding member of the Vector Institute. Professor Fiedler's contributions in machine learning and provision span many different areas from generative models to scene understanding, 3D and the combination of language and vision. Uh, so uh, please welcome Professor Fiedler and uh, you are welcome to start the presentation anytime. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me try to, to share the screen. All right, you see this? All good? All right, so um, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about um, the efforts towards learning-based simulation, data-driven simulation for robotics. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, my part of my job is uh, at NVIDIA and at NVIDIA really kind of the, the vision for the future is in 3D, right? So the vision is that anything that is built will be visualized. Anything that moves will eventually be autonomous and anything autonomous will be or maybe even needs to be simulated before you can deploy it in the real world. So there's really um, like large needs for physically accurate uh, simulation of very complex virtual worlds. So for that, NVIDIA has been um, developing this platform, visualization uh, and simulation platform called uh, Omniverse, which is really cool. So it allows you to essentially connect different software uh, for visualization, for example, Maya, Blender, you know, all the things that you might be already used to, and also very easily to plug in any tech. You have any uh, new physics algorithm or maybe AI uh, uh, you know, content related algorithm, you can just plug in using Python code. And that basically creates a real time photorealistic uh, visualization. Okay, so this Omniverse is out, the open beta is out, so you guys can try it, but let me just give you a sneak preview of what this does. Oops, very loud. So what you he see here is uh, rendering happening in, in Omniverse and all the, you know, all the lighting or the physics or the rendering is done real time. It's basically being rendered in front of your eyes. And this is really, you know, possible, obviously for hardware, but also um, advances in graphics and AI, AI and graphics working together. breaks on this light. Um, all right, so one domain where this really real-time photorealistic uh, rendering is very important among other things is for simulation, right? So for example, for uh, something like autonomous vehicles, you can't just deploy them in the real world. You need They need to practice in simulation against all sorts of different scenarios. And you do want to test against all the sensors that maybe a car could be equipped with, which means, you know, LiDAR, but also cameras. Um, and, and, you know, what you're seeing here again is real-time rendering and the ego car is driving this car and all the world is being created. Um, right, so the nice thing about simulation is that you have full control over the environment. You decide the maps, the world, the number of actors, the kind of scenarios you're gonna be uh, playing out, the behavior of these actors. So all, all that is uh, controllable. And, and this is the way basically to test these vehicles. All right, awesome. So maybe I'll start the first five minutes, just a little bit of motivation, because this all looks great. You know, everyone would like to have a simulator like this. Uh, making simulator is really hard. Uh, so maybe the first five minutes I'm gonna spend on 
how to actually make a simulator, what are the main challenges, and what I think uh, is the future I'm going to talk about later. And I'm going to give you an academic perspective. I'm going to give you a perspective of basically Antonio's and my group adventure in the last six years in, in creating an own simulator uh, called Virtual Home, which essentially simulates indoor activities. So we have different households and we have different agents in these households that are tasked to perform different things, different activities. I'm going to talk later about what that is. But essentially, we want them to behave human-like, do everything that you know humans would do in their home. Um, we want to have multiple of them so they can actually collaborate. Uh, so here we have a couple of different characters, a couple of different households. Again, you have all the control you want over the, sim the environment. So you can switch on the lighting. You can rearrange furniture if you want some variation. And all that can be done using Python scripts, so it's all programmatically controlled. You have full control over the sensors, so cameras in this case. And of course, this is a simulator, it's a graphics engine. You don't need to only render images, you can also render ground truth. So all the ground truth, all the segmentation, all the stuff that's super hard to label or even get in real world video comes for free from a simulator. Right? So if you want to test or maybe even train some perception algorithm, this is, this is a fantastic cheap platform to do it. Cool. All right, so how did this happen? So Antonia and me were at a, this workshop six years ago, and we were thinking about all these data sets that were available for segmentation, depth prediction, and we're thinking that this is not really evaluating the real task that we want to do, right? We eventually want to have robots in the household. We want them to do things, right? So what does it mean for me to predict a pixel is some sort of a segmentation label, right? It doesn't tell me much about how well I'm going to perform the final task. So kind of after a bottle of wine, we decided, well, we need a simulator and we want to build something like a Sims game where we're going to have you know, re realistic environments and robots that are able to collaborate with kind of human-like uh, uh, agents, uh, same as humans would do, right? And that's the way maybe to train these robots to eventually become part of our, our lives. So that was the, the initial goal six years ago. You know, finally, we're kind of releasing this simulator. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about what does it take to create a simulator, right? So the first thing you need is the assets. This was the first, very first thing that we, we needed to do. And this turned out at the time easier than we thought. You go to this Unity store, you can get a pretty nice collection of uh, assets for very few dollars here, $35, like uh, I think 200 different objects here. And even composed in a home, even in the same package, we, we could find like six composable um, households, which was awesome. And you need characters, there's a Mixamo, which allows you to download these characters actually for free and quite a few of them. Maybe not super realistic looking, but you know, they're free. So this is, this is fantastic. So it seemed easy enough to get started. And of course, the next question is now what, right? And you have this environment, this was easy and you have these characters there, right? But it's not doing anything, right? So the next thing we need is some sort of animation clips. So we want this character to start moving around the same as uh, you know, human agents are moving around. This also turns out to be easy enough, at least to get started. There is Mixamo that allows you to download over 2000 animation clips and each animation clip even has a little bit of control. So you have some variation for each clip. So that also seemed quite easy enough, right? It's not only important to animate uh, human characters, all the objects in the environment also need to animate. And, and that's where things become harder. So you need to animate a fridge that can open, a toaster that, you know, the toast pops out, toilet seat goes up and down. And this is where the real manual work starts. Uh, and it took a lot of time to actually annotate all this stuff, right? So imagine that we have done that. The first time you run your simulator with all the activities, you get something like this. Nothing kind of works as expected because we have maybe forgotten about physics and we forgot to you know, annotate masses and the kind of physical parameters of all the objects. Okay, so then the next step is, oh, well, we need to annotate all this content and this took a huge amount of time. So you need to 
and that all the physics related properties, all the materials that are relevant for simulation of these objects, and also interaction related properties. Right? Yes, we have those animation clips for maybe grabbing an object and maybe walking towards something, but interactions really depend on pairs, right? The object and the kind of task or activity you want to do. So if I want to open a laptop, I want to open a door, I want to open a fridge, or I want to open a box, it's a very different action and very different interaction with the object. And all that kind of needs to be annotated, which again is, is not easy. But you know, after a lot of work, you can get decent physics and decent um, interaction with the object. Just to kind of visualize this again, um, right? Like switching on action is very different for switching on a light or switching on a TV or switching on a coffee maker. And again, this means that you actually need to kind of hand code all, this in, all these interactions. Okay, the next thing is kind of getting activities, right? So we have this apartment, we have this guy that can maybe walk, that can maybe jump or whatever animation clips we downloaded, but we don't know the scenarios. We don't know what kind of activities can happen in the house, right? And this is really where we are after. We want this robot to maybe make a dinner or a, you know, clean up some room, right? So this is really what we're after here, right? So, and there's so much stuff or so many different scenarios that can actually happen in a home, right? And then that, that felt daunting. Like how are we actually going to now hand code all these activities that can happen? Um, and we felt we were a little bit smart here, and we decided to do present activities as programs, where we're gonna break down a, a complex activity like you know, uh, cleaning a room or making tea into a set of instructions, sequential instruction. Uh, for example, walk to the kitchen, grab a kettle, put kettle on the stove, and so on. Okay, and each of these individual instructions over here is easy or at least easier to animate, which is what I described before. For example, walk into the kitchen would mean you can compute, compute a target location in you know, semantically labeled room as kitchen. And then you run some path navigation uh, with obstacle avoidance to that point. And then you play the walking clip, walking uh, animation clip. All right, grabbing a kettle, you have the annotated target pose, you have your current pose and you can do some sort of physics optimization for this uh, hand animation, right? So each of these little instructions over here, we know how to animate, but we do want to understand the sequence of this, um, this instruction, so the sequence of these actions that actually make up a scenario, that make up an activity, okay? But representing it this way, um, it makes it easy to crowdsource it, which was really kind of the, one of the key ideas to, to have at least a bit of scale over here. So we took this um, um, interface called Scratch, which is essentially an interface to, for teaching kids how to code. And now this, this makes it easier. So we have one annotator saying, you know, describing basically one activity in language. And we have the other annotator kind of reading that and trying to compose a program that would implement the sequence of actions uh, needed to perform this particular task. And you know, if the UI is easy enough, then you can even have mechanical turkers doing this for you. So this is a recording of one of them annotating this particular description. And this is pretty awesome because now you can just pose this in mechanical turk, you've got results almost in a day and you can collect tons of different activities. And we got uh, almost uh, 3000 of them here. So here is like just one example of um, setting up a table. Here is you know, one more for making coffee. And it turns out that different annotators would create different programs for the same activity, right? So for example, for making coffee, one would use a coffee maker, one would use a kettle, one would use sugar and milk. So you get this really nice rich variability for each particular um, activity over here, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so we basically created this kind of robot wiki how, where you know the robot um, could go here, download all these programs, and it has different categories of different activities. And for each of them, you have the examples of these programs that tell you how to actually perform that activity. And it's almost like 3,000, 20, 2,800 of these guys. Right, and, and now you can finally put stuff to test and do some really cool stuff, right? 
Um, we know that using language, we can we can control human characters to go around and do stuff, right? So here is a language description. But you can also use language to put robots walking around, right? And the way we do this here, you encode this language description, and now we formulate this as program synthesis. Because we have those descriptions from before, we have the example of programs, and we're basically just treating this as a translation from language to a program. And that program, we know how to basically roll out in our simulator. And it's kind of amazing how similar this actually is. Like this character is actually behaving quite similarly to a human. So this is pretty cool, right? The other things you can do once you have this exhaustive list of activities is um, start, start thinking about collaboration, right? So we have one human agent that is performing basically the activity that we annotated. And then we are using RL to train this other agent to essentially learn how to help the human to perform that task faster, right? So if the task would involve finding or preparing something, then maybe this robot can actually learn to find that and put it in a place that's easier to find for the human uh, character. This is called virtual home social and the actual benchmark is online if any of you wanna play with it. The other thing you can also do, and I already talked about it, is like, uh, from sim simulation, you, you can render all the ground truth and you can render it for free, which means that, you know, you can treat this as a data set, if you will, right? And you can train your perception algorithm on this data and then maybe test it um, on the real world. And that would kind of be the ultimate hope, just because you are able to synthesize now tons of different activities. Okay. And now we come to the first problem over here. Uh, this was kind of our, our thesis was let's use this data to train and test on the real world, but there's problems, right? And the problem is that there's just not enough variability in our data. We have only the six different apartments. We have some objects for some classes, we only have a single object. So networks are just overfitting severely on this data that we were able to create here. The other problem was we collected this 2,800 programs, which is pretty exhaustive list of what people can do in a home. Um, it turns out that those contain this like 75 different atomic actions. So these are these animation clips, if you will, like simple, simple actions like walking, grabbing, finding, and so on. And around 300 mentioned objects. Okay, and it turns out that only a few of these we are able to animate. So we were only able to implement in you know, many years like here, like 15 or 16 different actions. And we only got some, some percent of these objects. I forget exactly how many, maybe like 200 or so, All right? So the problem is we can only really animate a low percent of all these programs. I think it's about 20 or 25% of them. For most of them, we're either missing an object or we're missing an action. So for example, right now our agent cannot lie in a bed. We just haven't implemented that animation, okay? There is low variability of objects per class, sometimes only one object. Yes, we could buy more assets, but you know, then things start expensive and it's hard to actually do this. And there's low variability of motions per class. We're kind of bound to these motion clips that we found on this uh, website, right? So, you know, it kind of brings us to a conclusion that Simulation is great, it's absolutely needed, but it's really time consuming to create. It's really hard to scale. And, you know, yes, maybe with infinite time, we can re increase diversity, but in principle, it lacks this diversity that the real world has, right? So unless you are, you know, a game company or, you know, a big company that can afford having thousands of engineers and artists to work on this, is just this is just not the right way. You cannot you cannot pursue this in manually, right? So kind of my my goal here, at least for my group at Nvidia, is going towards data driven simulation, simulation 2.0, where we're gonna have AI in all the stages of the content creation process that I described, and hopefully it's gonna inspire some of you to work on this. I think it's a really cool problems. All right, so basically we wanna have AI in all of this. We wanna get AI to scale up asset creation. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. Um, getting animations to scale up different animation, scale up different scenarios that we can simulate and, uh, and um, uh, yeah, simulate 
And then maybe something that can help us annotate, right? Like we don't want to annotate all these interactions as physics content. We want to have something that can help us do that or at least do it in a scalable way. So I'm not going to talk about all this today. I think we only have like 45 minutes, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing here for at least um, some of them. So let's talk about, you know, introducing AI in the asset creation um, process. Right, so basically the way I'm kind of imagining what we need to do here, we want to synthesize or construct or synthesize the entire world, right? What does this mean? We want to synthesize a map, maybe a floor plan of a house, if this is a household simulation or, or a, a map of a city, if this is like something for dry simulation for driving, right? And a map is kind of, um, you know, kind of the layout of the world. Then we want to synthesize objects to populate this map, where are all the, where is the bed, where are the, you know, household items, where are good, where they're gonna be placed, such that there is diversity and realism in them, and of course, then is also 3D asset creation, or how can I scale? In, there's 300 object classes that we mentioned. How can I get, you know, thousands of examples for each of them? All right. All right. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, how can we actually synthesize maps? So here we had a, a little bit of work on synthesizing city road layouts uh, with AI and particularly just, you know, unconditional synthesis and then as interactive generation. So we allow artists to maybe um, anchor parts of the city look like, you know, Cambridge or this guy should, should have this kind of intersection and then should look like New York. And then the same model can also be used for parsing with maybe I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so how we formulate it, uh, you know, kind of layout synthesis is, is, is a graph generation problem, right? So if you think of this as a map, a map of a city, right? Then the nodes are the, the nodes are the control points and they have attributes. So X, Y, that basically places this, this control point on a canvas. And then an edge would be just a linear segment that tells you whether the road uh, connects these two different control points. Okay, so this here would be just a center line of a road, right? All this like seems very complicated roads. Okay, and we're going to treat this as a completely supervised problem by taking open street maps, which is like, you know, large scale crowdsource maps uh, from all over the world. And, and we're just going to train a network to generate these graphs. Okay, and in our case, we had a very simple model where essentially we're going to be sequentially decoding this graph. And imagine that I have already decoded some part of this graph and I'm popping out this orange node over here and this, all these blue nodes have already been uh, synthesized and I wanna kind of complete this node. So find all the remaining nodes that uh, neighbors, neighboring nodes that I haven't synthesized yet. Okay, so the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna have some sort of a C, uh, RNN that's going to encode all possible paths of max length, you know, some hyperparameters K that are incoming to this node V over here. So in this case, this would be one path, this would be one path, maybe this would be another path, this would be one path. So we have an RNN encoding of each of them. And then we're just gonna sum all the hidden states, the final hidden states to represent this node uh, V over here. And then we have a decoder over here, which is going to be another RNN that's basically decoding one node uh, with attributes X and Y in, in a sequential manner. Right, so the network would look something like this, where this is encoding all the different paths. And the way that we're encoding a path is basically with relative X and Y uh, um, positions relative to the node, uh, to the central nodes for which we're synthesizing all the neighbors. Okay, and we're also decoding uh, kind of relative X and Y relative again to this particular node. So, so here we're doing something super simple. We're just basically treating X or delta X and delta Y as independent and just treating as a multinomial prediction. So, you know, one out of K options for X, one out of K option for Y. Um, but, you know, you can think of this, maybe you can do something more fancy over here. Okay, so let me play this video with some results. So here you can also condition on, you know, city code. Like you can make, you can condition your generation on mimicking New York, mimicking Toronto or whatever. 
You can also just provide some anchors with some styles and then synthesize the rest. You can also use this generative model as a prior for what you know these maps look like, and then um, and then kind of you know denoise your uh, your parsing parsing from the aerial images. So you can infer basically maps from aerial images and maybe create variations of them. Um, so you have variations of different city. And again, you can populate here, which is use a procedural model to populate the vegetation houses. Right, so a super simple model already gives you a pretty cool, right? We, we kind of have, have a city, right? It's missing life. It's missing uh, objects that are going to drive around, people that are going to walk, walk around, but, you know, it's getting there, right? And this was super easy to create. All right, so this was city maps. Now, what about object layouts, right? What does that mean? We want to populate this map. We want to populate this map with objects, right? And again, you can treat it as a supervised problem, the same as we were treating as a supervised, completely supervised problem for the for the map creation, right? Which means that maybe we have graduated from RNNs to transformers, but essentially what we have over here is some encoding of the layout, which we assume we're given then assume that we have already generated some objects so far. We're going to encode each of them. So this is the class. This is the kind of the translation. So relative translation of the object or location of the object in the, in the map. Rotation and scale of the object. We're going to encode each of these objects, feed it into some sort of a transformer. And then we're going to decode the next object to place. OK? And we're going to predict, essentially, class uh, location, rotation, and scale, and we're going to treat this as a um, mixture of logistics, just similar to mixtures of options. You just have more heavy tails. Okay. And again, this can be, this can be trained completely supervised. We're going to take a data set of a data set of already created floor plans or populated rooms. Okay. And you know, you got pretty reasonable results already. You have this pretty nice model now that can be independent or invariant order in which we are generating this object, uh, which allows for interaction. So a user maybe already have part of the furniture in their home, and now you want to com auto-complete with some suggestions for other furniture, for example. There is just some uh, comparison with past work, where the key thing is that this model generalizes really well. So we haven't ever seen this kind of very weird floor plan over here in our training set, and this kind of shape over here. But these transformers are amazing. So they're actually able to generalize to this uh, layout and basically learn that it should ignore this hole in the floor plan and still kind of generate you know, plausible, plausible room layouts. And our method is also like almost real time, so you can use it interactively. Now, this is all supervised, all right? So for the maps, it kind of makes sense. People have crowdsourced this uh, open street maps. It's already available. Here with indoor furniture, it becomes a little bit trickier because someone actually had to create this or annotate this. So maybe if you're some sort of an architecture firm, you have access to this. But most of the time, this is actually also an annoying process, right? So maybe we want to kind of graduate from having a completely supervised approach to using a lot less supervision. Like, can we get away by basically just looking at images, videos, right? Just basically looking at raw data and still learn how to synthesize objects in a plausible way into these scenes, OK? Now, obviously, this seems like a daunting task, maybe even a, you know unsolvable task. But it turns out that you can do it if, if you have certain priors about how scenes look like. Okay, in particular, in our case, we're going to turn to how you know games create worlds, right? And they all resort to procedural models, right? So imagine that I have here a procedural model or probabilistic grammar uh, for like an outdoor scene, which basically tells you, you know, I'm placing a road, and each road is composed on some number of lanes, right? And maybe I decide on the distribution of the number of lanes that I expect. 
And then each lane can have some number of cars. And then maybe next to a lane, there's always a sidewalk or maybe with some probability there's a sidewalk and so on, right? So you can imagine that this grammar over here is now generating uh, kind of a scene graph. It tells us which objects are in this scene. And each of these nodes over here also has attributes, right? Which places that particular node, that particular asset somewhere in a physical 3D world. Right, so for example, the, the attributes would be the location, the height, or the scale of this object, and maybe the pose, maybe even other things like color and so on. Right, so here is like one example sampling from this probably the grammar where you know these distributions of uh, attributes or distributions of you know the number of lanes have kind of very loosely defined. We didn't pay a lot of attention how to define them. All right. So obviously, in, if I was an artist, I would need to be very careful in specifying the distribution of what's a plausible pose for a particular car given the parent lane pose, right? Because I want this car to be aligned with a lane and so on, right? Now, if I have a car and I'm gonna place another car, again, I might wanna be careful about the distribution of where I'm gonna place this other car or person. Right, so this might be simple for this very simple probabilistic grammar I'm showing here. If you have very large complex worlds, then setting these distributions is also not an easy task. It's very time consuming, All right? And if I wanna drive in New York, I wanna have scenes that look like New York versus Toronto versus a little village somewhere in Italy. I'm gonna need to go and look at the data and manually define all these distributions, okay? So of course the first, thing where machine learning could come in is, why don't we replace the artist? Like the artist can tell us the rules of how the world is composed, that seems simple enough, but why don't we just learn all these distributions from data, from just like given images of a particular place? Okay, so how are we going to do this? We're going to encode scenes, like basically the scene graphs, um, using a graph neural network, a GCN. And we're going to rely on this kind of a prior that the artist has created. So, you know, the number of lanes we're going to consider that we have some prior on that, a prior on the attributes, which can be very loose. And we're going to sample essentially scenes from that prior. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to encode this scene with a GCN. And we're just going to train it to repredict the attributes. So you can think of this as some, somehow auto encoding the prior. We're pre-training this GCM to repredict its prior, right? That's kind of the, the simplest thing we could do to start with. And the next thing is we want to modify the weights of this GCM, so we want to kind of fine tune it such that it's going to predict or repredict these attributes to be more plausible, to be more aligned with the data that we're actually seeing. Okay. So, so here is then the second step. We're kind of, we're gonna bring real data into the picture, okay? So what we're gonna do in the first step, we're just gonna sample the, the scenes from, from this prior. Um, we're gonna rely on the structure being correct, but what we're gonna wanna do with this GCN is modify the attributes, okay? We're gonna reposition the cars, reorient these cars and other objects such that the rendered scene is gonna look more like the, the data that we have actually collected, okay? So essentially we encode this, we encode this scene graph, we are making predictions in each node uh, that's predicting attributes. This allows us to render each individual scene. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, um, uh, we're gonna try to train this GCN such a distribution of the render scene is similar to the distribution of the real scene. So we have some, we need some notion of comparing the two distributions, okay? So in reality, we're gonna sample a batch of real scenes, a batch of synthetic scenes, and we're gonna compare them uh, with, you know, some distribution uh, matching uh, loss over here. So in our case, we're using uh, MMD, so it's maximum mean discrepancy. I have a slide that describes this, but it's essentially is a frequencies approach to comparing distributions. Um, where you want to basically have a distance between higher order statistics um, of, of, of the two distributions, okay? What turns out happening is you, you need to compute this kind of a loss 
which uh, requires you to embed each image into some feature space. Here, we're just gonna use inception net features and then compare these features uh, with some kernels, right? To avoid the uh, you know, high dimensionality of, of, um, of this embedding. And here we just use like a Gaussian kernel to, to make this comparison. Okay, what you can also do is, so right now all we're doing is we're just trying to make these render scenes look like these real scenes in some feature space, some semantic feature space, right? But the cool thing about you know, having uh, machine learning in the loop is that we can also optimize our data to be relevant for the tasks that we ultimately wanna perform. So for example, if I know that I wanna render this as a data set uh, along with some ground truth on which I wanna train a detector and I wanna train a semantic segmentation network or maybe a depth predictor, right? Then what I actually can do, I can render this data. I can have a black box task network that is trained on this data evaluate in a very tiny labeled real data set and use that score to propagate back to my, to my GCN over here. So give this additional task related gradient um, to training this network. Of course, this is all non-differentiable. So here we're just gonna use um, RL to train this, um, this part. Um, okay, awesome. So this would be training distribution, of course, we want to train structure too, right? Right now we're assuming that the artist is going to tell us what well, New York roughly has from four to five lanes, uh, or you know some some sort of a hand-designed multinomial distribution over the lanes. But maybe we want to avoid that too. Maybe we want to learn the entire thing from data. Okay. And and here we're going to resolve to the the probabilistic context-free grammars, and essentially we want to learn a generative model of strings that are plausible under a grammar, right? And the string is gonna give us basically this kind of little structures. For each of them, we're gonna use the previous approach to predict the attributes that gives us render scenes. And again, we wanna kind of um, maximize similarity to, to real data. So I'm not gonna go into tons of details, but essentially, you know, we're, we're assuming we have this uh, context-free grammar over here, right? Which has symbols and each symbol uh, can be expanded into new symbols using some, you know, grammar rules until you hit the terminal symbol, right? And typically in probabilistic context for grammars, you have a, so, a probabilities associated with these rules. And here we're kind of after learning those probabilities, learning how to sample these rules, okay? So our generative model is going to look something like this. You're going to have a latent vector that we're gonna ma map into this unnormalized uh, probabilities for all the sampling rules. And given the parent, given what we have already synthesized uh, from before, so given our next generation task, we know, we know which symbols is plausible. So under our rules, so we can just make a mask over here to make only, only the symbols um, plausible that are available for that rule. All right, so... Um, and, and essentially, you're, you're going to sample that, that rule, um, feed that back in, and then you know, repeat this process. You can have this kind of recurrent, recurrent neural net generating or learning how to sample these rules. OK, so, so this gives us some sampled rules, which you can convert to a graph. And now you can sample parameters using something like we, we, we talked about before. And then you, know, you can render this into uh, an image, right? This is a much harder problem than before because before the problem was predicting attributes. So this is a continuous problem. This requires discrete sampling. This requires sampling from a discrete distribution. And this is, this is non-differentiable, right? Um, and we're gonna use RL to train this. Again, I'm gonna not talk about the details, but just to give you a flavor of how this can be solved. So here are some results. So on the right side, um, we have samples from Kitty. This is a real data set. Here we have samples from this uh, initialized probabilistic grammar where the prior tells you, um, you know, basically you have almost no trees, almost no pedestrians and very few cars in the scene. So the prior on the structure and attribute is pretty bad. Um, and this is what you get after learning. So these are scenes optimized with, with our method. We call it MetaSim. So you can see that the model both learn how to populate this scene 
you know, in a plausible way, and also kind of place them correctly, right? You have these cars being aligned with the roads and pedestrians are kind of closer to the uh, to the camera, probably because these are the kind of scenes we have recorded in real life. I have this tiny plot in the top right, just to give you a flavor of how well we can actually learn this by basically computing the histogram of, of cars in the scenes, right? In dark green would be Kitty, and then in orange would be this prior that, you know, has a, um, is, is basically saying that we have very few cars in the scene. So, you know, we have this peak over here for two cars. And then the lime is our learned, uh, like histogram from our learned um, model. So you can see that even though we have not used a single label, not a single label, you can actually match pretty well the histogram of the real data. So this was quite surprising to me. It was pretty nice. Right. And, and of course, I'm not going. I'm not going to go into details here. But you can also evaluate this model, right, in terms of how good of data is it generating, right? So we're going to generate the data along with labels, and we're going to take a task network, train on that data, and then evaluate it on the real world, and then see whether the performance of this, you know, black box task model is improving as we're optimizing our our data generator which is pretty nice, right? Because in the real world, you have a data set, that's it. You're stuck with a data set. Here we have control over what that data is and we can optimize that data for whatever task we want, right? So ideally this performance would just be going up as our machine learning models advance. So here is like a result of um, basically what's happening during training. So the first, First shot, first frame is basically just sample from this probabilistic grammar. Any next frame is basically how, how this uh, AI model is modifying the scene to look more like real data. So you can see that very quickly it gets it, very quickly it starts aligning uh, the object with the, with the scene. And of course, this is a generative model. So now you have the luxury of generating infinite amount of scenes. If of course you had the assets, right? Which brings me to the last point over here, and I think I have what like five, ten more minutes um, about asset creation, right? So now we know how to synthesize floor plan, how to synthesize plausible layouts with or without supervision, and we can do it pretty well in either case, which I think is pretty cool. And then now we want to actually have a scalable way of creating the three D models, three D CAD models, three D assets, right? So kind of the wish that we want to do is, is, is maybe we just want to enable a user to take a picture of an of a object and we want to use you know, a machine learning model to produce a 3D asset, right? What does that mean? We want 3D vertices with faces, right? A mesh, uh, maybe a texture map or at least color on each of the vertices. But as I talked about before, you want more than that. In fact, maybe we also want materials Right, we want to know that this is like a fluffy koala, uh, or a car is metal and windshield is transparent. Right, we might want to have really detailed annotations of each of the parts because imagine I want to animate the eye of this koala or make it walk. Right, so we want to have parts and maybe even skeletons. Right, so we want to achieve this, but we want to achieve this with as little effort as possible, as little manual effort as possible. All right. So kind of my wish is there's tons of data online, right? If I just go on Flickr, there's like millions of cars, millions of bicycles, buildings, dogs, humans, and so on, right? There is like a hundred times less of this or even a thousand times less of this on any kind of 3D marketplace available today. Imagine that we can take all this data that's available online and turn it into high quality 3D assets. Right, this would just be groundbreaking. This would completely change, in my opinion, the simulation. Okay, so you know we we know we know how images are formed in graphics, and we're gonna kind of turn to graphics to help us in this quest, right? So we know that images are formed by geometry interacting with light, right? So you have mesh, geometry, light, texture, um, material maps. I'm not drawing here. This goes into some graphics renderer that outputs an image, right? And now there's been a lot of work, right, on making these black box graphics renderers that were not traditionally uh, differentiable, 
but you can somehow approximate them or maybe even find analytic gradients so to, to basically these black boxes, these renderers. Okay, I have here some explanation of how one of them can work, but there's just so much work right now on this stuff that it almost doesn't feel right to dis describe one of them. But essentially, you have different types of renderers, rasterization based, which are very simple to make differentiable. And then a little bit harder, you can have a ray tracing based uh, uh, renderers with maybe model secondary light effects as well. So something like Mitsuba and Mitsuba 2 and so on, right? So there's just tons of work on this. Um, but right now we're just gonna pretend that this, this differentiable, that we have a differentiable renderer over here. And how does this help us? Well, this helps us a lot, right? Because we can take an input image. We have some sort of a neural net over here that's gonna try to predict the graphics disentangled properties. But now instead of having a 3D supervision of these properties, which we don't have, we don't have that for this image from the internet. We're gonna do something different. We're gonna throw it in this render, which is gonna produce an image. And then we're gonna define our loss on the output image to be basically matching the input image, All right? So this loss is essentially going to compare the rendered prediction with the input image. And we want this loss to be minimized, right? L2 or whatever we're gonna define over here. Um, in, its, in its most naive form, this, this has trivial solutions, right? I can just copy over the texture being an image. This can be a plane. I don't care about the lighting, right? So this is not, you know, trivial to make to work, but essentially you, you can using some sort of regularization losses, maybe a loss on the two masks also being similar. And one other thing that really helps in quality is having a few views of the object during training. You don't need a lot, but at least a few views such that you can enforce consistency of prediction across, the, across different views. And that helps you regularize this to actually start learning 3D. Now, of course, the problem becomes like, where do I get these few views, right? On the internet, rarely people post multiple views of an object, right? Um, but we're gonna do a really cool trick over here, right? Because we know that we can train image GANs to consume internet pictures, to consume all the pictures of cars. Right, and we know that samples from these models look really realistic. Okay, and this image guys essentially map a latent code. Um, you know, here I'm showing style again into some sort of style latent codes, and then this is transformed using the synthesis network into an image. Okay. And if we're just kind of looking at style gains late on space, you're gonna find surprisingly uh, great disentanglement. And like just poking in that latent code, you can find that the first four layers of this, uh, first four of the style layers are essentially encoding viewpoint to a pretty good disentanglement with the rest of the latent code, which kind of represents content. So what I'm showing over here is keeping the content code frozen. So these are the remaining, uh, I, th I think like 12 layers, and then varying this first four viewpoint uh, codes. Right, and basically, Stalgen is now made into a renderer. It's basically rendering the same car in different viewpoints, which is pretty awesome, right? Because it has never seen, probably never seen the same car in many different viewpoints. It has just seen millions and millions of cars, and it's able to do this extrapolation. And if you look closely, you're gonna say, "Hey, Sanya, this is not really true. This car is is losing identity a little bit during in different viewpoints, but it's pretty true." Were I good enough maybe to train our networks? And the opposite is also true, right? So if I now keep the viewpoint code fixed here in each individual column, I have the same viewpoint code, but then vary the content code. Stalgen is now basically rendering different cars in one viewpoint, in the desired viewpoint, which is awesome, right? Because this is exactly the data that we need to train our inverse graphics networks. Right, so we're taking this idea to the simplest possible form. And the only trick we're gonna do is we're gonna use gen GAN generated views during training to impose consistency. Um, and this works great. So this is the input image. This is the prediction rendered in that same view as the input image. So you see that actually quite, does it quite well. And then here's a prediction rendered in other views just so that you can appreciate uh, the 3D quality. 
it's not perfect. Like you can see some of these reflections over here, um, but in, in you know majority is pretty good. Now, what does this allow us to do? It allows us to sample 3D content, sample it as easy as sample images. I can just snap a photo and I get a 3D card, which is pretty cool. So, so here is a, a demo in, a, in Omniverse where the user could just like select an image. And here comes real time, a 3D asset. It's not maybe a, you know to the level of quality that an artist would create, but you no, know, it's pretty damn, damn good given that it's perfectly for free. Um, here I just kind of like showing that it's not just cars that it's able to do; it can also do other objects. It's a bit tricky. So, for example, if you look at horses, it's missing backs, and why is it missing backs? Because Stalin is not able to generate the top of the horse; it has never seen it. Horses are very tall. And it's hard to, to get pictures of you know, horses' backs. And the model just doesn't have any gradients over there. So it just kind of goes with the regularization and kind of paints these flat regions in the top, um, which is kind of funny. Um, do I have like two more minutes or should I stop here? Um, so two more minutes should be OK, but we will not have much time for questions. It's up to you. I can also stop here. OK. so. Um... I guess maybe we'll go to the questions in this case. Sure. Right. So, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I invite everyone to thank our speaker. <laughs> right. uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to read some questions from the audience on uh, in the chat. So the first is uh, the problem on layout on scene generation seems to combine aspects from structure and relational discovery and NLP with the grammars. Uh, do you have insights into what the suitable geometry is for representing scenes? Yeah, I mean, here we just had very simple, okay, I showed basically what kind of representation we had and maybe you guys have better ideas. Um, Let's see which one, for example, here. All right, so here we are not even representing geometry of the asset. We're just representing the geometry of the layout, All right? And we're just, you know, here is the floor plan and we're gonna process it with some sort of a CNN. So, you know, hopefully that can learn something about the structure. And for each of the object, we, we experimented a little bit what we should be encoding over here, but in the end, um, what worked really well was the class, the location, rotation, and scale. So that was the kind of geometry. And then we let this transformer, which has all these uh, tension mechanisms and so on, kind of process the relationships between these objects. Um, now you can imagine making this more complicated by actually encoding geometry of the assets themselves, right? Which might help you for collisions and things like that, because right now the object is essentially a box. Um, but assuming that you don't have, or you don't want to care about the assets that you're placing in these boxes, then this this looks pretty pretty good, right? Um, for the grammar part, let's see what we did over here. Um, here was just basically a GCN that was processing this data. I don't have a good picture over here, right? So each data had a bunch of uh, attributes, right? So it's basically a graph, again. And each, each node has location, it had height. So basically these attributes of a car similar to the, to the indoor scene. And then we're allowing this GCN to encode this. So nothing like too fancy on the geometry side. Um, okay, uh, thank you. So at some point during the talk, you mentioned the use of uh, maximum mean discrepancy MMD for distribution matching. Does it work better than other kernel or optimal transport distances between distributions for your problem? Yeah, we did an experiment. So in the follow-up, we used like a KL, and this, at the time we used MMD. Um, I, I I can't really claim that it works better because we haven't tried a lot of the options. We played like with different kernels, and this kind of worked the best. But there's a lot of different ways to compare distributions, right? Um, 
And here we wanted to have a simple one. Some, some of the distribution matching would, would require you to know the probability distribution of the data. In this case, uh, probability distribution of real images, right? Which would be kind of hard to get. So we wanted to have a very simple, very simple uh, distribution, right? That would just kind of be able to re represent the semantics of images. So, you know, these encodings of, of different images and, and, and match the statistics of this, this, of these images. But I, I, I can't claim that this is the best one by any means. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, one popular question was, how do you use reinforcement learning to learn generating scene data? Uh, for example, what do you give as a reward? And I think this is also related to how we use RL to sample from the discrete grammar. Yeah, I don't think I have slides over here. Maybe I have slides over here. Let's see. I assume that this is for the um, for the learning the structure, right? So, in the in the previous project, which was just learning the distributions of the attributes, we use MMD, right? So, we kind of when we wanted to to basically learn uh, like let me put this here, right? So you could also use MMD here as a reward. Right, because you you can generate a, a batch of, of data, right, of real data, a batch of synthetic data. You can compute some score, which is essentially telling you how good, how well these distributions are aligned, and then you know you can back up using reinforce or whatever, right, to to the network. Um, now that turned out to be hard because the credit assignment is hard, right? You're getting this one score for a full batch of data. And we just couldn't train that network, right? So we had we had some some tricks essentially um, that is gonna is is gonna give you a score per sample, and in particular we're gonna compute the likelihood of a particular sample scene or a particular sample uh, of p being synthetic, so p of that that sample being either synthetic and p of this being real. And there are some tricks how to compute that. So essentially, we're we're computing the this likelihood in a non-parametric fashion using KDE. So we're we're encoding a batch of data uh, in some feature space, and we're using um, like our KDE to to represent this uh, this likelihood, right? And that gives you basically a likelihood for each individual sample. Um, and then and then for RL as a reward, we're just using a log likelihood. As a reward for seeing or local likelihood the ratio, sorry. Right, and it's reinforced. So we're using that as a score. So there's a lot of details in the paper. I didn't want to go over this just because I was lazy to make all the slides. Um, but it, it was a lot of bells and whistles to make this to work, just because um, you're training a very complicated network, right? It can sample a lot of different objects over here. And um, you want good gradients, right? You want credit assignment per sample, um, right? Which essentially means that you need to compute some sort of a, you know, log likelihood of a sample, each individual sample. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for answering all these questions and for the talk. I invite everyone to thank our speaker again, and we'll be taking a break before the next uh, the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.